Hello everybody, Richie here, community manager of NIMIC. So we were discussing in the community about new ideas for videos and we actually posted in the forum some ideas that we, we had. So for people to say which is their favorite idea, if you haven't visited the forum, the link is below in the description. So make sure to go there and also give your opinion. We're going to continue doing this regularly. So we had some questions and community answer the things that they actually want to learn. And the main thing was, can you explain a little bit more of Albatross? So here we have Janos, a blockchain developer of Nimic, who is also one of the guys behind Albatross. And he's going to give us an overview of the Albatross consensus algorithm, a proof of stake consensus algorithm that was written or invented by Nimic developers and also Twinklet software developers. Okay. Yeah, so, um the thing is, we start with the normal blockchain we have, right? And so we just ha added a new contract type. Basically, we have contracts already, right? HLCs and stuff like that. So let's have a contract here. And I'm not good at drawing, but it's called the staking contract. And let's just uh, pretend we already have a running blockchain, so we have transactions, right? So when I have a transaction, but now we have special transactions and that's called a staking transaction. A staking transaction, what you use to basically like insert your stake and just begin uh, yeah, staking. So that will be a normal transaction with some extra data. Um, that extra data is basically your address, like an address from where you stake and uh, address where you want to have your reward, reward paid out. Usually that can be the same, but for some scenarios uh, you want to have different addresses for that. And there will be a validator key in there and that key will be used later. So that goes then into the staking transaction just by the transaction being mined, just like any other contract. So there will be then an entry here or multi, like a lot of entries for each staker saying this staker stake 1000 NIM with this validator key. And we know how, how much NIM, let's say one, uh, let's say, ah, wait, <laughs> 10 NIM and then maybe 20 and maybe 30 and whatever amounts. So now, now we can start with the blocks. So let's assume we have a macro block already and we just get that from the last epoch. And that macro block will have uh, it's not an ordinary block, it doesn't contain transactions. Um, well, we will come to the details later. But it has, a, it has attached to it a list of so-called slots. And those slots basically are tickets where the block producers will get drawn from. But first we have to get to those slots. And those are now randomly picked from the staking contract. We know how much everyone has staked. And basically you can imagine it like, like a spinning wheel where the fraction of error you have is your amount of NIM. So this stake will get better uh, or will have a higher chance than um, to get a slot. So let's just say he gets a slot and then we have slot number zero. And right now we have 512 slots, that's just a fixed number. So we do that for all uh, 512 slots. We, for each of those slots we pick randomly from the staking contract um, those entries in regards to their stake. So maybe the second one gets a slot and so on. So now basically those slots tell us who or we can, we can look up which slot is basically owned by which entry now. And those are important to now produce the micro blocks. So let's start with the first one. It's gonna be block number zero. 
in that epoch. I'm gonna have that here to just show that that's the start of the epoch. And we have a normal block here. Um, by normal, I mean that's now the kind of block that has transactions in it and all that kind of stuff you would expect from a, um, from a blockchain. But that's not important for the consensus. We just make, need to make sure that it's produced. Uh, in proof of work, you would do this by, uh, by like, um, brute forcing a nonce and getting a hash but uh, we want to not, not use proof of work, but we just randomly, again, select one of those slots. Um, and so one of those slots will be allowed to produce that block. For example, number 11. And then we know, okay, number 11, if slot number 11 is allowed to produce a block, we can also look up which um, entry in the staking contract that is and basically look up the validator key and make sure that only that validator associated with that stake then produces that block. So we have the first block and then we just continue. And everyone in the network can check that that was done properly and we will get the next one. And that's also again randomly selected from the list of slots. So this time it might be a number 213. Um, and we get the chain. And since we don't need to brute force anything, everyone knows who's producing the block. It can go pretty fast. So we then produce m much more blocks here. In fact, right now, 127 of those until we arrive at the end of the epoch, or almost end of the epoch, and now we want to basically start from here again. So we need to get to this macro block. And the macro block is not produced by a single producer, because um, we want to have like kind of, let's, let's use the term checkpoint, it's not the same thing, but um, it's kind of, it marks the end and uh, will also select new source, as we will see in, the, see in a second. Um, to produce the Marco block, all, validate, uh, or all, all of those slots and all validators that have those slots will now basically vote on, um, wait, first, first, <laughs> first, um, to make the Marco block, um, we will se select one random slot again, like for the micro blocks. And that will do a proposal. Let's say that's number 420. And that's a proposal. So that's not like producing a block, but you're just proposing, hey, this is a valid macro block. At least I'm telling you it is. Everyone will check that it's valid. And then um, all those validators that, that are here in that slots list can now vote and their votes are also counted like e each each slot is basically one vote and if they have two thirds so um, this one will be accepted uh, let's say accepted at two thirds and that's then the next macro block uh, and then we can start over again this one will again, select the slots from the staking contract and start the whole process again. And with that, we can always get new stakes from here. So new stakers can get slots and be part of the, uh, of the nodes that produce those micro blocks and verify that everything is correct. That's for the op optimistic case, but what if someone there's something wrong or doesn't produce a block because we only have one producer. If he's not doing it, what are we gonna do? And for that, I need to find my uh, assistant, <laughs> Pascal. Pascal. Who's the assistant? You need chalk? Yeah, I, I do have some chalk. Okay, perfect. One minor addition uh, to the market block. Actually, there are two rounds of voting occurring here. But that's more like a technical detail. In the end, it's important that uh, two-thirds basically approve that block. 
but yeah, let's take a look what can basically happen during such an epoch and how we counter any misbehavior or failures of nodes. So it might be that simply, let's have a look at this next microblock here. Let's say this would be uh, the microblock that we want to produce and let's say this should be produced by a slot number 12. Okay, what happens if this slot number 12, the validator of this slot, is offline? Or it could be even misbehavior or malicious behavior and he doesn't want to produce the block to just basically stall the chain. What happens is that all the other slots, they wait a little bit for a timeout and after this timeout occurred, they can vote. Basically one round of voting and this is the so-called view change. So basically they will create a, uh, a proof, a view change, a view change proof and two thirds of the validators need to sign that thing. So if you have two thirds signing this proof, it actually means that some other validator, some other slot is chosen to produce the block instead. So instead of this one, we didn't show up, it will be a block down here at the same block number, but produced by, for example, slot number uh, 249. And that basically uh, is the case that some block didn't get produced and we just by a simple two-thirds majority can basically switch the block producer to another person. So now I need to do some magic because I need to remove some stuff for the other scenarios to consider. Uh, so wait a second. Okay, I'm back and the blackboard is clean again. So let's have a look at what else can happen. So we had the case that one of the validators just went offline and couldn't produce the next microblock and we solved that by basically choosing a different one. So what happens if a validator produces a microblock? Let's say this one. And it's the slot number 45. But this same slot might also produce a second block at the exact same block height and now it could try basically a double spend attack. It says here transaction one is part of this block but here we have transaction two and they contradict each other. So what do we do in this case? Because only one of these two might exist uh, or sh should exist. Um, we let the next block producer choose which one to build upon. So the next one, because in both cases it will be the same actually, Let's say it's slot number whatever, 54. This one now gets to choose which one to build upon. But it may only build upon one of them. And okay, now we have basically one history and the chance that basically uh, more and more forks occur decreases exponentially because of our security assumption that two thirds of the validators are uh, not misbehaving. So basically the chances that there is a chain of forks is two thirds to the power of the length of the uh, fork chain. But um, okay, we also still want to basically punish uh, the misbehaving validators. That, that is true both for the view change case and for this fork case. So what the other validators can do, they also need some proof. In the view change case, we had the view change proof that two thirds signed here the validators, they can simply take the, the two block headers here with the signature of the block producer because this is sufficient proof that the block producer misbehaved and they can build a fork proof. So this is a fork proof and that basically includes uh, header one. So the header for this one basically and 
a second header, block header, which is basically the, this block header plus the signatures to these headers. And that's proof enough uh, that this slot number 45 misbehaved. So what do we do with misbehaving uh, slots? We always punish basically this slot number. And what we do is we exclude this slot number from the rewards. The rewards of the all, whole epoch are shared. So basically all the transaction fees and all the block rewards are summed up. And at the end, at the Marco block, we divide all the fees and rewards over all the honest slots. So those that were not misbehaving, and that means those that were not uh, basically proven to, to have misbehaved by a fork proof or a view change. And that is the economic disincentive that we need basically to, um, to, m to mitigate people actively doing this stuff. And the second thing that we do, because we don't want the offline validators to remain basically in the staking contract and being selected in the next epoch again and again and slowing the whole protocol down, what will happen? They are basically marked uh, uh, for being uh, parked. We, we, we named this basic, basically being parked. But basically what that means is we, we make a little mark at these accounts in the staking contract that corresponds to the misbehaving slots and say, okay, either you basically give us a new message within a certain time frame and tell us, oh, I'm online again, sorry, or we automatically will remove you from the staking contract after two epochs. So these are the two types of punishments that will happen there. And now for completeness, uh, there, might one, there might be one more case of misbehaving validators, which is a validator, we can just do it basically at the end here, the next, next one produces a block which is invalid. And invalid means, for example, that it includes a transaction that is impossible. Yeah? Other validators will try verify the block and will see, no, this block cannot exist like that. What will happen? You will basically, um, right now, just not listen to that slot for this, uh, for this microblock anymore. Don't accept any other microblocks from this producer, basically, and start a view change immediately. Basically, get another producer to boost the block instead. And one thing we're currently considering is whether we can punish that one as well. Uh, that's basically work in progress. But it would be nice to also punish this uh, producer that produced invalid blocks as well. OK. I think that's mostly it. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, Janos, did I miss anything? No, I think that sums it up. Uh, but if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. Yeah, and don't forget to subscribe and like. <laughs>